Um, I'm Officer Scott A. Fonts of Diamond Police. My partner back there, um, Officer Fonseca. Um, I've been with the department since, uh, for 22 years now, Officer Fonseca, probably about 18. We've also, we're also members of the uh, Semlec Search and Rescue Team for the last seven years now. Um, the uh, Semlec Search and Rescue Team is a uh, regional team made up of uh, 18 different police departments around the community. Um, and basically we pool our resources. Um, why we're here, it, uh, we are charged with protecting and rescuing people with Alzheimer's disease, children or adults with autism, children or adults with Down syndrome, people with brain injury, people with mental illness, people with intellectual disability, anybody that's going to wander away, either from their home or from a group home or any of that. Um, some of the stats from 2011 with the uh, Alzheimer's some point disease process, 60% of dementia, people with dementia have a missing incident and, can, and may be unable to return safely to their care setting. And the Alzheimer's Association said half of uh, these people are not found within 24 hours. They could suffer um, serious injury or death. A night like tonight, they wander off. They're not wearing a jacket or anything. It's 20 degrees out. They're not going to uh, last too long outside in the cold. Um, some individuals went missing on multiple occasions. Majority have a, uh, a singular event um, and they don't respond to or they hide from searches who are very close to them. Um, usually when I talk to uh, what we do, if we ha come across somebody in the uh, community that has um, wandered away, either Alzheimer's or dementia or autism, uh, myself or Officer Fonseca will go visit the family and uh, We'll talk to them about some of the programs that are out there for them um, and how we can help. And usually when you talk to them, this ain't the first time they've gone missing. Usually if they go missing once, especially with Alzheimer's or dementia, they'll, they'll keep on doing it. Uh, it's growing concern. Approximately 127,000 people get lost annually in the U.S. Roughly 34,000 reported to police. Approximately 13,000 never found. And the resources are required for search and rescue wanderers and the law enforcement, are, we are required to search for them with diminished capacity or missing. Um, there's no 24 hour rule or anything like that. They report they're missing to us, we automatically go out and we start searching for them. Um, nursing homes are not immune, 25% will wander or become lost. 70% um, have elopement claims involved the death of a resident. 45% of elopements occurred within the first 48 hours after admission. And each week in the U.S., at least one nursing home resident will wander off and die. The 45% of the elopement, um, they choose it because they're, they're put into a different environment from what they used to. Usually they're going from their home into one of these, their, their, where they call home for the last maybe 30, 40 years. Now they're put into a, a different place. So that's why, usually how they want, why they wander away. Um, some of the stuff on autism, 92% of parents with children who have autism report that their children are at risk of wandering. wandering. Uh, elevated death rates among those with autism or a large part contributed to drowning after they wandered away. Um, this is big um, in the academies now. They're, they're teaching all the new recruits and in service um, where to go look for people that wander away with autism. The bodies of water, the high tension lines, all that stuff. That's all, there's a lot of training with this stuff now. Uh, boat risk, people with the uh, on the autism spectrum are often a boat risk after rescue. First responder must stay with the rescue person, being very alert to the possibility that it may suddenly take off. This is stuff that's taught right with veteran officers and uh, recruits. Um, some of the technology that's out there, uh, three categories, radio frequency, cellular, or GPS. Um, using technology to save life, um, safety net, as it's called now, uses radio frequency technology to track and rescue missing people at risk. Ralph's going to talk to uh, you guys a little bit more about the uh, safety net stuff a little later. And using technology is one option among other strategies, coping with wandering behavior, something and people becoming lost. Some of the things I recommend, we have a, uh, a registry. Um, if we do go to your house, um, we, for lack of a better term, we put um, your residence in as a hazard. So if any of our officers go there, they know there's a person with dementia, Alzheimer's, or autism. Um, and also, um, we have a form that we can ask the family or the caregivers to fill out. And it would have a picture of the person and some contact information 
information and some basic information, um, height, weight, name, stuff like that, and who to contact in case they do want and we find them. Um, some of the other stuff we, besides the stuff that we um, recommend is um, door alarms. I went to a house one time where the um, his gentleman was taking care of his mom. He had these door alarms on there and they could, they could wake up anybody. And there was a pin and at night he would pull the pin out and that would arm it. And if you open that door, it was, it was like a fire alarm in the house. But those are just some of the things that are out there. Go through some of the GPS stuff. Um, we haven't come across a lot of this stuff now. Mostly what we do on the police side is if we go looking for a missing person, um, if they have a phone, we can track their, their phone, what's called a, a ping. If they use, uh, they have a GPS capability on their phones. I haven't seen any of the tracking devices out there yet. There was a few companies out there. Um, some of those are, uh, um, went by the wayside, I guess, but there's always new stuff coming out. Uh, some of the advantages of GPS can provide indoor positioning information and greater accuracy. It's usually fast, faster than unassisted GPS. It would tell us, uh, as in the phone part, it would tell us where they are right now, where, and depending on the carrier, it would tell us how far away from a tower. So we would know if they're in our town or if they wanted somewhere somewhere else to Cape or somewhere else. Uh, GPS not dependent on availability of network can, can provide very precise worldwide, worldwide outdoor positioning information any time of day. Some of the dis disadvantages, whoops. All right, some of the disadvantages, natural barriers such as mountains, thick foliage, uh, clouds, artificial obstructions, such as large buildings and dense communities can, in can hinder the satellite signals. And for this reason, GPS tracking inside buildings is seldom possible. Also, GPS tracking in large cities is not always reliable. Um, this is some of the GPS OKs that were out on the market. Um, some of the other stuff. Um, when you decide on the device, um, type of device that best serves your needs, consider following where it will likely be used in private residence, care facility, indoors, outdoors, or in the multiple locations. Where will a search likely take place within a building, outdoors, in an urban or rural environment, in a tree covered or open space in a waterway? Which devices are more appropriate for these settings? And how much freedom movement will the device allow the person? And if necessary, will the person with dementia be able to use the device? And who will be doing the monitoring or locating family, caregiver, police, mostly having new batteries in it, charging, that type of stuff? Um, this is some of the stuff with uh, the radio frequency that they did. Um, the uh, GPS and the radio frequency, both technologies have, the advantage, have some advantages. The GPS-based systems provide theoretically exact and historical location information to the person wearing the device, whereas the RF frequency or the radio frequency, which is um, going to be the safety net stuff, um, can, be, can easily pinpoint the location of a person wearing the device when they are in the area. Um, some of the stuff would talk a little bit about SEMLIC and what we do. 28 communities, population of 400,000, um, 842 square miles. Um, we're up to 40, 40 team members now. And these are all the communities that are part of SEMLIC. Either they have members on the team or they are just part of. So any of these communities we can get called out for a missing person. Um, basically what we do is we look for people and we look for things. Evidence searches, somebody threw a gun out of a, a window, um, evidence of a crime they may call us out for and we would go searching for a person or things. Uh, some of the three major components, management team, ground search team, investigative team. Uh, the management team, our uh, planners, the mapping, documentation, they're the, um, the members that do the uh, planning of the search, where we're gonna search, how we're gonna search and what resources they're gonna send there. Um, Search managers, uh, certified by the National Association of Search and Rescue, uh, trained and responded to missing and abducted children incidents by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, um, certified as SAR responders too by the New England Wilderness Search, and nationally certified as SAR Tech 3, and uh, certified to a minimum of ICS 300. The ICS is Incident Command. Um, Officer Fonseca and myself have gone through uh, most of this stuff, so we're search managers. So if we have an incident in town, we could um, 
stop the management of the, the search until uh, other, other uh, managers would arrive. Ground search teams, what we call the ground pounders. We have uh, 40 guys on the team. Anybody could do this at any time. Um, all the certifications they have, or training, clue recognition, um, man tracking, stuff like that. Uh, land navigation. Um, we do wilderness searches, urban and suburban searches, evidence searches, and uh, light uh, search and rescue. The investigative team, there um, we have four or five officers um, on this team. They're the detectives. They're the ones that would go talk to the family and get that information that we need to help us plan a search or to um, switch a, a search from one area to another. Um, some of the equipment we have um, is the safety nets stuff up here. We have a thermal imager, uh, metal detectors, night vision stuff. Um, we have, um, I think, a, probably about 10 or 15 ATVs that are on the team. Um, in Dartmouth here, we have two. Um, so any or all of those uh, resources can be sent out. Um, these here are tracking sticks. Um, basically, they would, they would put one of those on one of us when we went out on a search, and it would be able to track us. Um, the new GPSs, the handheld GPSs we have do that same thing, so we kind of moved away from that to the uh, regular handheld GPSs. Uh, thermal Im imager, um, Officer Fonseca will pass that around later. We have, a, we have one here in Dartmouth. Um, it's a lot smaller than that, a um, lot more compact, um, and that's basically what it looks like. You're looking at an, a big open field, and it picks up a heat signature, and that's what you would see. Um, night vision stuff, we have some of that stuff um, on the team. We don't use it too often. Um, <coughs> usually we usually use the thermal imager. It's a lot, a lot better for the uh, type of stuff that we're looking for. Some of the GPS the stuff that's out there, this, is, this here would be what a track would be, um, what it would look like. We'd come back. Um, we had a search in Berkeley, um, and all the teams that went out to search an area, they had the GPSs on. They turned them on. Um, once they get to the area their they're going to search, and when they came back, they download all the information, and that helped the search managers um, tell them where, where everybody uh, had gone, what resources were used in certain areas. The all-terrain vehicles. Um, safety net, which uh, Ralph's going to talk to you about in a few minutes. Some of the outside resources um, that we could use or sometimes we train with. Uh, Mass State Poli ha Police has their own search and rescue team also. Uh, Mass EPOs, they, they're trained also. The uh, DCR, um, Sheriff's Department, Fire Departments, Red Cross, EMS, and um, we, we've had used uh, civilian search and rescue teams in the past. Um, we just did, we're doing some training now with, with the uh, Fire Departments here in town, which are going to take the next couple of weeks or so, so we could have them as a a quick and readily resource. Uh, future growth we're looking at. Um, we're already up to 40 guys now. Um, organization of child abduction response team. Uh, state certifications we're always trying to do. And uh, FEMA as a type 3 wellness search and rescue team. Um, some of the stuff with traditional search methods. methods. They're time consuming when time is critical. Requires many resources and can be expensive. Um, some of the searches we've been on um, over the last, last seven, since we've been on a team, um, this needs to be updated a little bit more, but we, we have some other stuff. We had uh, a Berkeley search. We were out uh, looking for um, a lost missing person. Uh, we were out there for four or five days looking for him. Um, the one in town here uh, 10 years ago, Neo Maximus, we've been looking um, still for him. And there's some other searches that we end up uh, getting called out to local. Um, this is one that searched, this one that was out of Taunton. 19 year old male took a dog for a walk, seven o'clock at night. Um, he didn't have any known disabilities. At quarter of 11, family called police to report the uh, male is missing. 12.15, um, our team was activated and uh, 11 of us showed up and we went looking for him. Um, seven uh, MSP canines deployed and reverse 911 calls were made. Reverse 911, if you don't know what it is, it's a, uh, basically you get that call on your phone, on your home phone, and it's more uh, a local type uh, a call, and they would tell you what we're looking for, give a description of uh, a person we're looking for. 
The way they have another uh, call would be a silver alert, which would be um, for an elderly person that um, had gone missing. And that would be more of a, uh, a larger area, such as if they get in the car and left the house. Um, 8, 10 a.m., um, subject was located in a neighboring town, 8.2 miles away, uh, still with his dog. He thought he had been missing for two to three days. Um, what, they, what we did, we sent out a regional broadcast on the radios um, in all the uh, area towns up by Taunton, and uh, one of the patrol officers ended up seeing him, um, the gentleman walking with his dog, and brought him, brought him to the hospital, and he ended up being fine and in good health. Uh, some of the things, what to do in case of missing or lost loved ones, Call 911 immediately, speak clearly, stay calm. And if you leave the residence, make sure someone stays at the residence. Have a current picture of the lost or missing person and stay calm. That's the biggest thing. Um, what we, uh, we also encourage is if you have somebody in your residence that is going to wander and they do wander and you can't find, you, you look for them for five or ten minutes, you can't find them, call us right away. We don't mind coming out. You find them ten minutes after that, you call it back and say, Yep, we found them. They were in the laundry room or wherever they're at. Um, and that's fine with us. But um, some of the searches we, we've been on, the families didn't want to bother the police. We're bothering you. You're not, you're not bothering us at all. This is what we do. Um, and any of the, the officers I work with, they all think the same way. We got, we, we got in this job to help people. Um, because the, uh, some of the... Uh, the stats are out there, an average person in good health can walk two miles in an hour. So if you were to wait an hour or two before you called us, they could be three, four miles away. From here, they could be almost in Fairhaven. So think about it like that. Um, any questions? Um, sure. An amazing job in just sharing all this information. Thank you. Um, it, it depends on what they're, if they're autistic, it's mm -hmm. different reasons. Um, just like if they have a, um, Alzheimer's or dementia, mm -hmm. usually with Alzheimer's or dementia, it's usually when they're put into a new environment. Oh, okay. Um, that's, that's usually when they, uh, wander off. Okay. Um, we've gone with cases with, uh, people with autism, it's, you know, it could be something simple like they're, they're very structured, so they want to do certain things. Mm -hmm. And if something throws off that mm -hmm. very structured environment, it may throw them off where they'll, they'll wander away or bolt. Yeah. And I know you mentioned um, a little bit about some canines. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we take this too. So how does that, um, do you have something in Dartmouth too, canines? We have uh, three canine officers here in Dartmouth. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, we also have uh, Semlik, which is... Southeastern Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council, that's what it's called. Oh, yeah. They have uh, several different uh, groups. Oh. They have a SWAT team, a dive team. They also have a canine group. And um, if we needed, or any department needed uh, canine dogs and they didn't have them available, there's, there's a, basically every one of those groups is, uh, they have a chief in charge from a different, wherever the community is. Um, I believe the chief in Raynham's in charge of the canine group. So you would contact him, and he would send out a message uh, to the, the canine officers, and they would, if they're able to respond, they would respond to uh, whatever the call was. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so say, um, say you were of, of the communities that somewhat mm -hmm. express um, member, mm -hmm. membership, um, but you were in another community, say, uh, is, I didn't notice that Fall River and New Bedford are not part of Semlik. Okay. Um, I think because they, they have enough officers that okay. they would be able to handle that stuff on their own. Okay. And if they say they weren't and say, uh, would, would, how would that work? Or, or, or if someone from one of those communities was lost at the mall area, would that then trip the Somebody area? from Fall River was lost yeah, in the was mall? Lost they're in our community. We, we go looking okay. for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's also what they call mutual grade, uh, mutual aid agreements between all these towns. Okay. So if Far River or New Bedford needed a, uh, we have a gun, a gun dog. Okay. Uh, it, it looks for guns and explosives. Mm -hmm. If they needed that dog, um, we'd, we'd be able to send them also. So there's the other 
Just because they're not part of what we do doesn't mean that we, we could still call on them or they could call on any of our resources too. Anything else? Okay. Um, on the table here we have some of, uh, Justin will pass around the thermal imager, but this is some of the equipment we have. I mean, um, Justin and I both have uh, one of those bags filled with stuff. It's rain gear, jackets, all that stuff. And then some of the stuff here that we have on the table. Um, most of it's basic stuff. We have a vest which carries um, all our gear from uh, you know, compass to glow sticks or whatever else we use. Handheld spotlights, um, night vision stuff, our GPSs, a regular compass, headlamps, all that stuff that was, uh, that was were issued. So uh, we, use, we bring all that stuff with us on shirts because you never know what you're going to need. <laughs> Thank you. This Thank is you uh, Ralph Poland. Um, he works for uh, Safety Net, which is some of the, uh, the tracking devices. Uh, that we were talking about. He's going to talk to you a little bit about that. Thanks, Scott. Um, again, Ralph Poland, uh, retired Marshfield PD. Uh, I did uh, found out about the safety net program back in 2010 when I was still on the job. Um, had no clue about any kind of uh, tracking systems like this when uh, we went and got a call one night. It was February, 22 degrees out, um, 8 o'clock at night, which is pitch black. Uh, and um, a woman called 911. Her husband was missing with Alzheimer's and she didn't know where he was. The problem was that she um, and her daughter went uh, looking for him for an hour before they called us. And it's like Scott was saying, you don't do that. You know, somebody goes missing, you call immediately. Um, so she didn't. And she went looking for him, then called 911. The entire four to midnight shift, the fire department, million dollar ambulance on standby. The state police sent a road officer, a road trooper. Environmental police sent an officer. The state police sent a helicopter with a 50,000 million gazillion watt flashlight looking for this guy. Out behind the complex where he lived was all woods, high tension lines. Uh, and again, he walked out with no coat. So they were thinking, um, you know, this, this is not looking good. Four hours we kept searching for the guy. Um, and then finally, about just about midnight, now the four to midnight shift, is starting to call in the midnight to eight shift. And obviously the four to midnight shift is not going home at midnight, you know, because the search goes on no matter what, like, like Scott was saying. So um, about 10 minutes to 12, dispatch gets another 911 call and it's for a stolen car in progress. And all of the police officers are out in the woods searching for this lost gentleman. They took two, two uh, officers off the search team, to send them on the stolen car report and that was him. He just, by luck, he walked into somebody's open garage and got in the family's second car. They came home at midnight, you know, but after being out with friends. They see someone sitting in their car. They think, oh, my God, someone's stealing the car. Call the cops. So the good news is he, got he was found. The bad news is all of those resources couldn't find him. Um, so uh, about three or four weeks later, at the time, I was a community service officer also, and um, there was a gentleman from the Norfolk County Sheriff's Department doing a presentation on the safety net program. Uh, and I was there and it was, wasn't out of his mouth two minutes when I'm thinking, where was this three weeks ago? So fast forward to, you know, a month later, we end up getting trained and equipped um, for, the, for the whole department. And uh, we presented this program to the CPAC in Marshfield. My, at the time, my daughter worked with the, for C, with the special ed program. And my whole mentality at the time was seniors, people with Alzheimer's and dementia, search and rescue. Um, and it, I'm, I found out about this. I'm at home all excited. I'm telling my family about it. And my daughter goes, Dad, this kid's in my class that could use this. So we introduced it to the CPAC in Marshfield. And in about a week, there's a dozen children on the program. Um, and that was back in 2010. And to this day, the majority of those kids are still on the safety net program. And what it is, it's a radio frequency, like um, Scott was saying, it's a directional radio frequency transmitter that somebody would wear either on their wrist or ankle. It has to be attached to the body. It can't be in a backpack or, you know, it's laced into the shoes because as we all know, sometimes these kids or even adults will take everything off. Uh, at that point, it's useless. So it has to be attached to the body. Uh, it has a seat belt material for the strap. This, the connector is one way, so once you put it on, you can't get it off. And it's completely waterproof. 
so you can swim, bath, shower, doesn't matter. There's a battery that goes in the back that we, t we tell the caregivers or d instruct them every six months. You take the back off, take the battery out, and put a new one in it. So the battery lasts six months. There's also um, the ability for law enforcement or public safety to recognize somebody uh, that has one of these things to identify them, even if they're nonverbal. Uh, and this has happened a few times. Um, perfect example was uh, this was out in a suburb of Philadelphia. Uh, a little girl, five-year-old girl with autism, got out of her house. And a, um, a gentleman who was a, a school bus driver came out to go to work at 5 o'clock in the morning. And he finds this little girl on his front lawn naked. And all she's got on is a Stavionet transmitter, which he didn't know what it was. So he calls 911. The police show up. They see the transmitter, and the little girl's nonverbal, and this gentleman has no idea who she is. So, cop takes out his trusty buck knife, cuts the strap off, open up the back, take the battery out. Inside is a frequency and an ID. The, the police department's uh, public safety has access to our database. So they call dispatch and say, I've got a little girl, she's a safety net client, her frequency is 216, 123, who is it? They go on our database, and within seconds, Susie Smith, she lives at 123 Main Street in Philadelphia or wherever. She has autism. She's nonverbal. Her parents are. Her siblings are. She is on this type of medication. Everything there is to know about this little girl, plus a picture. And with the mobile data terminals that officers have now in their cruisers, dispatch can email that information to the on the street to the cops that are in the cruiser and they look at the their screen that's the little girl there's no question about it so they wrap her up in a blanket take her back to 123 main street and it's seven o'clock in the morning knocking on the door the parents come you oh, know what's going on oh my god it's the police is this yours <laughs> they had no idea that she got out um, and the same thing happened over in brookline uh, brookline mass just outside of boston the middle of the day Gentleman's walking down the street, day shift, and the police officer is driving along in his cruiser, and he sees this gentleman walking down the street in July with winter boots on, a parker, and one of those hats with the floppy ears that come down, which is basically winter clothing. Doesn't look quite right. He stops, gets out. Hi, what's your name? Where are you going? Nothing. The gentleman's nonverbal. Can I help you? Can't get any information. The officer sees the transmitter again knife cut it off open up the back the same routine yep that's john smith he's 87 years old he's nonverbal. he has alzheimer's he lives in a secure facility uh, at 123 main street so they put him in the cruiser drive him back to 123 main street and they're all running around the, the facility trying to find john smith because they can't you know he's missing but they didn't report him missing so before they even reported him missing the officers could tell who he is and how to get him home. Um, the transmitter um, is, like I said, radio frequency as opposed to GPS, where GPS will give you a general area, you know, like it's the, the person is in this building. Uh, the radio frequency, when the officers are using this, the equipment to find this transmitter, and that's what they're looking for, something that big. When we train them, when re reality it's on a person but it is literally pinpoint to where that transmitter is. So if the child or the adult is, has bolted or, or eloped for whatever reason, they're scared, they're afraid, they're gonna hide somewhere, you can't hide from this. Uh, since 2010, when we started the program, there's been, as of two days ago, there's been 692 calls for search and rescue around the country for people on this program and every one of them has been successful. Yeah. Uh, and even what we would, Scott uh, uh, alluded to also, even what we call the late calls, and also the, the, the person that I told you about that his wife didn't report him missing. We've had people wait four, five, six hours before they report the person missing. Um, and even those people were located within minutes. The average search time for somebody on the safety net program is about 30 minutes. We're lucky here in Massachusetts uh, because this is where it all began. We're a Boston-based company, but we have complete 
ser a search and rescue in this entire state, and Rhode Island for that matter, um, because the Massachusetts State Police are trained and equipped. They have it in their air wing. We have 95 police departments and our fire departments that are trained and equipped, and seven sheriff's departments. So anywhere in the state of Massachusetts, if somebody goes missing and the individual police department in that, where that person is missing does not, is not tra safety net trained, then either the sheriff's department or the state police would be first responder for that person. Um, we just had the, the uh, state police just had a, um, a rescue up in uh, West Springfield. This is uh, fair, the big E they call it. It's a fairgrounds where it takes tens of thousands of people that go to this, I guess, daily. And um, there was a woman from Plymouth who uh, their family took her to the Big E to, you know, for a day of uh, festivities, and she went missing. They, they turned around, and all of a sudden, she was gone. The, peep, the, the family contacted the detail officer that was at the, at the Big E. He calls dispatch. Dispatch knows that the state police have the safety net program. They call the state police. There just happened to be two off-duty state troopers that live in that area that had the equipment in their car. They went to the Big E, met up with the um, West Springfield PD. They gave them an, uh, an ATV to work on because that, there's you know, acres and acres of land. They located her in less than 15 minutes. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to you know, imagine why uh, a police department would not want to get involved with this. Number one, as, as we all want to know, it saves lives. This, this saves lives. But it saves agencies thousands and thousands of dollars in search and rescue operations. You know, when I think about uh, the, the rescue operations that I hear about that have gone on for, you know, hours, days, weeks, sometimes, you know, like Scott pointed out, which horrified me when I first started learning about this program, 13,000 people in this country go missing every year and are never found, just gone. So they got to be somewhere. And then, you know, as time goes on, you know, 15, 20 years later, somebody buys a, a piece of, uh, you know, 200 acres of property and they're going to put up a mall and they start digging and they find bones. You know, it's, it's the, sometimes people are found that way. But um, what, what I like to talk to when I talk to agencies about this program, like I said, number one, it saves lives. Children, adults, could be veterans coming back from a war zone with a traumatic brain injury, could be uh, somebody that was in a, in a motor vehicle crash that has a brain injury, anyone that would wander off and get lost. This saves lives, but it also saves them thousands in search, and us, tax dollars, in thousands uh, in search and rescue operations. And I've got a couple of um, videos that I want to show you. And three of them are of a nine-year-old autistic boy that went missing in Virginia. And it was in a battlefield, 2,000 acres, nothing's fenced in. And he was with his dad and his uncle. And they um, were at, you know, like well, looking at one of those um, racks in the, on the wall where there's got you know, a gazillion flyers. And they oh, where do we go next? What are we going to do? And all of a sudden, they, you know, turned around and gone. They searched for him for five and a half days. And so you, I can't imagine it, but people, parents, relatives, families that have children, five and a half minutes is too long. Five and a half days they searched for this little boy. And I'll tell you right now, they did find him alive. Um, but what I want you to look at is the background as to what was going on during the search. Caterers, tents set up, porta potties busloads of volunteers looking for this little boy. Um, and keeping it in your mind, listen to what the, you know, the deputies are saying, but keep it in your mind as to, you know, like a cash register. What do you think this is going to cost? What, you know, just put yourself in the, you know, in a mindset of what do you think, because I'm going to ask you afterwards, what do you think the, that search and rescue cost? Five and a half days. So um, my technical ability isn't that great, but I'm going to see if I can run this fine. You got? Another day has passed since a nine-year-old autistic boy disappeared while walking with his family on one of Virginia's battlefields. Hundreds of volunteers have joined in the search. 
Robert Wood Jr., known as Robbie, wandered away from his family at North Anna Battlefield Park north of Richmond on Sunday. Now search dogs have picked up the little boy's scent. The dogs have alerted on that scent in the area where he went missing, and it's taken us um, to the river, uh, to, the, to the North Anna River. Um, and in all other areas, the dogs haven't alerted yet. Nearly 900 volunteers were trained and then dispatched into a 2,000-acre search area Wednesday. The battlefield is not fenced in, so officials are concerned the child may have wandered off the property. The boy was last seen wearing a red long-sleeved T-shirt, blue athletic pants, and blue shoes, and because of his autism, he doesn't speak. Ross Simpson, the Associated Press. Hey, Vanna, you want to take care of this one? So that's, that's day two, 2,000 acres, still searching for this little guy, um, and they, they couldn't find him. Um, so then the, day five um, is this one here. Yep, the sea. Down, down, yep, good, yep. This is day five, and again, look at the background. The fall of darkness did not mean the end of a day's work for those trying to find a missing nine-year-old autistic boy. Dogs uh, work well at night because of... Uh, the way the air currents work, um, the way that the weather is at night, the dew points, things like that, uh, and the way the scent acts uh, makes things more conducive for the dogs to work in the evening. And search coordinators also say the night brings other benefits, like the fact that children tend to sleep at night, perhaps making it easier to find them. But that night search didn't locate Robert Wood Jr., known as Robbie. The boy wandered away from his father and brother as they hiked in a park near Richmond, Virginia, Sunday. Tucking my children in bed has taken on a whole new meeting. While crews worked through the night, others attended this candlelight vigil. I can imagine how much love his family has for him, but his community has it too. They hoped for the safe return of Robbie. Police say they are operating under the assumption that he is still alive. But it's a frustrating effort. With no results overnight, hundreds of volunteers were expected to be back at it Thursday, the fifth day of their work. Matt Friedman, the Associated Press. So that was day five is coming up. Day five and a half is when they did find him. Um, and again, you know, when the sheriff is talking, listen to what he's saying um, about, you know, where they thought the little boy was or how far away he was or what the distance was Robert he was when he was last been, seen. Robert Wood Jr. has been found and reunited with his family. He was found at approximately 2 p.m. on the uh, Martin Marietta uh, Quarry property. It was approximately three quarters to a mile from where he was last seen. The search is over. The investigation continues. And there are a lot of people to thank. It, it appeared to be a creek bed uh, next to the quarry property. Uh, west of it and when I say west of it I'm talking about uh, just off of a roadway uh, and he was found down it was somewhat of a gully we had been told by the experts that we may very well find him in a fetal position uh, and I think that's where how we found him but I know we have uh, searched that area before I don't think uh, you know we've, we've had some it's been a challenge uh, dealing with child with special needs who's lost. I think you've all been made aware of those challenges. Uh, I can't tell you that he was there. I don't think we walked past him. Uh, we're just thankful that, that he was located. So uh, three quarters to a mile from where he was last seen. With the tracking equipment that we have that law enforcement has, the distance on the handheld antenna is a mile. So had he been on the safety net program and the sheriff's department were trained and equipped, they would have found him in less than 10 minutes. Um, so anybody throw a guess out as to what that search cost? Half a mil? I know, uh, 500,000 dollars, right? No, more? Oh God. Yeah. 1.3 million dollars. Wow. And what year was that too? That was uh, about three years ago, okay. three or four years ago. But if you, you know, we're looking in the background, they had to bring in catering companies. They had to bring in porta parties. They had to, you know, bus loads of people coming back and forth. And you saw the helicopters. They had a fleet of helicopters, 900 people looking for this little boy. 
and they wouldn't give up. And then the sheriff mentioned that um, he don't, doesn't think he walked past them, but he was th less three quarters to a mile away from where he was last seen. I find it hard to believe that 900 people uh, were searching for this little guy nine years old and he was hiding from them all behind trees and bushes and rocks and hills and valleys. They walked by him probably three or four times. But like you said, he was probably in the fetal position, tucked in underneath a, br a, a you know, bush or, or something in a, in, a, in a little gully, and they just walked by him. So the good news is he was found alive. You know, uh, and you know, what the little guy went through as far as trauma goes, no one will probably ever know, but, uh, but at least is, you know, he was found alive. Um, there was another, uh, when I, like I said, when I found out at the program, uh, we brought it to town. Uh, we introduced it to the CPAC and the Council on Aging. And within a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, four weeks, there was about 25 people in Marshfield that are on the program. And there still is today. It fluctuates. You know, like I said, there was uh, three or four of the children that were, you know, seven years ago that were on this program have progressed to the point where they're not going to bolt. They're not going to wander off. So they really don't need the program. Um, so it varies between 20 and 25 people in, in Marshfield. And there was this one guy uh, prior to us getting this program that was always getting lost. And his name is Vinny, my pal Vinny. Mm -hmm. And um, he lived with his wife, lives with his wife, Virginia. And they lived in a peninsula in Marshfield where there was ocean on one side and tidal river on the other side. And Vinny's MO would, he'd sneak away from Virginia when he could. And he would walk up to the main drag, uh, Route 139, and there was a mom and pop variety store there, a Rexham General store. And they all knew Vinny, so they'd pretend, you know, he had money and they'd give him a cup of coffee or a muffin or a soda or whatnot. And, and then he'd leave and invariably get lost on his way home. And uh, I wasn't on duty this time, but I got word that a, a woman called in a panic screaming 911, there's a strange man in my living room watching TV and I don't know who he is. You know, she came home from work around five o'clock. Meanwhile, everyone's out looking for Vinny, you know, in the neighborhood, they can't find him. Um, so uh, this time we convinced Virginia, the guy, Vinny's uh, wife, Virginia, that he needed to get on this program. And he was the first one that we put on it in Marshfield. Um, and that was again, that was back in 2010, we got the program. Um, so Vinny went on the program, A couple of times he cut it off. He, his favorite thing to do around the neighborhood was to sh uh, prune shrubs. So he had a pruning shears, and once in a while he would whoosh, slip it in and cut this thing off. And both times we had to go find it, and it took a total, the first time, a total of about 45 seconds. Um, it was in the house. He had stuffed it down in the cushions in the couch. And then the second time we found it, I wasn't on, but uh, the, the other guys that found it, he had hid it in the mulch behind the house. Uh, so that took about a minute and a half to find it. So anyway, Vinny goes missing on the safety net program, but this time you'll see in the, in the video that he, it was on a leather strap on his ankle with, put on with bolts uh, because we have that for the people like Vinny that cut these things off. So anyway, uh, keep in mind also that now Vinny was stuck in the mud at dead low tide in the river, nonverbal, and the transmitter was literally 12 to 18 inches in river mud which is really thick. So GPS, cell system, probably would not have got the signal. And you couldn't see him from the street, and he doesn't know he's lost, so he's not like the Boy Scouts going, hey, I'm over here, you know. It's, he's just sitting there waiting for the tide to come in and drown. So Virginia, on the video it says, Virginia um, called 911. Well, she didn't. She went looking for him first for an hour, and then she drove to the police station and the uh, officer that took the program over for me, well, when, after I retired, happened to be in dispatch. So she will, walks in and he goes, yep, Vinny's gone again, but this time he's on the program. So he goes down, fires up the equipment, puts Vinny's frequency, every single one of these things has a specific frequency and ID, plugs Vinny's frequency into the receiver, shoots down to the house, instantly picks up his signal, and within 15 minutes finds Vinny stuck in the mud at dead low tide in the river. And again, you couldn't stand from the street. And also the news reporter that's talking about it says that the antenna on the cruiser 
uh, brings you within three miles of the, of the transmitter, which was wrong. She made a mistake. It's a quarter of a mile. So once you get a signal from the Omni antenna that you are within a quarter of a mile of that person, then we teach the officers to switch over to a handheld antenna, adjust the receiver, and within seconds, it gives you an exact pinpoint direction as to where the transmitter is. So that's what Greg did. He got out, switched it over to the handheld, and within 12 to 15 minutes found Vinny stuck in the mud uh, waiting for the tide to come in. So, uh, Vanna, if you want to put this, uh, and that's the, uh, the Marshfield one. It's my pal Vinny. And again, he looks like Charlie Manson. Live from Boston, WBZ News at 6 starts right now. Entangled in a marsh with high tide approaching, the family of a man on the South Shore had no idea just how much danger he was in. And as Christina Hager shows us tonight, a small piece of technology saved his life. Police road. say Vinny Di Natale is lucky to be alive, and because he suffers from Alzheimer's, he has no idea what a close call he's made it out of. He usually comes back within a, you know, five or ten minutes, but he didn't. The 82-year-old had gone for a stroll up the couple's Marshfield Street. When he never came back, his wife Virginia called police. Luckily, he was wearing this, a new tracking device that sends signals to a special antenna. It can take a police cruiser to within three miles of the bracelet where a handheld antenna hones in. It narrows it right down to a pinpoint. Normally, when Mr. Di Natale goes out for a walk, he heads this way to his favorite store. But this time, he went the other way. This is where he ended up stuck deep in this marsh. He was in an area where nobody could see him. It was a remote area, uh, very close to the South River. Uh, he was trapped in a uh, patch of briars and uh, unable to get out. Police say they would have had no reason to check in the depths of this marsh, but for the little bracelet sending out signals. It basically saved his life today. The band around his ankle that Vinnie Di Natale had complained about at first. Now he's used to it, and his wife... I just feel so much calmer just the fact that he has this dumb thing on here and it works in marshfield christina hager wbz news and we're glad it does i wish christine hadn't said dumb thing but uh <laughs> it works anyway so um so vinnie you know like i uh, was saying he usually goes in one direction to go up to the store um but this time he went the other way had he not had this on and he was reported missing we all would have been going in that same direction, looking for Vinny again. Meanwhile, he's that way, waiting for the tide to come in. So, um, for a less than a dollar fifty a day, uh, I don't see why this this program isn't you know, worth saving somebody's life. It's just uh, it's just that it's it's old school technology, and it works the best. And like I said, we've had uh, 692 calls, and every one of them has been successful. So, with that, uh, any questions or Yes. How do you deal with autistic kids with sensory issues? We, uh, we have, what we do is that there's so many people have been so um, ingenious as to how to get this thing going, you know, get these kids to wear this thing. And um, some of them have done it like a reward thing. Um, you know, if you wear this for an hour today, you get to play with the iPad for an hour, or, you know, things of that nature. Uh, and we also have uh, dummies, fake ones, that we just give people to say, hey, just try it. You know, see if it works, because it's uh, it's a lifesaver, and you know it's it's gonna, all it's going to take is one time. Um, you know, like uh, Scott was saying, people with Alzheimer's dementia, when they wander, um, if they wander once, they're usually going to do it again. There's just you know, and that's statistics. It it happens, and especially like when they they get uh, from their home of 50, 60 years into an assisted living facility. It's a completely foreign. Uh, you know, furniture, foreign place. The, all they want to do is get out. This, you know, I'm, this isn't my house. I got to get out of here. So it's critical. The first was a 24 hours that uh, when people are put in that they're watched constantly, but they still get out. But there are ways that, uh, you know, parents have uh, figured out how to get this on the child because it's going to save their life. Mm -hmm. Do you have anyone um, say who can't get past the sensory issues, but values the technology and would gamble and pay. Do you have folks that maybe yes. put on shoes, just even though they know that yes. shoes on? Yes. Yep. Yep. There are some that, that would do that. We we don't require it, 
but it's you know it's like th in, it, you know we can't guarantee it if the child or the adult you know takes off their pants or, or you know throws the shoes away and takes off it's useless Yes. Um, I was just wondering, so one for the cost, is that $1.50 a day for the wearer or for the police station? For the, for the caregiver, for the oh. caregiver. It's to, to purchase the transmitter, yeah. uh, a one-time charge of $495. Okay. And that's it. And then once a year, mm -hmm. um, you, would, you would call, or the caregiver would call Safety Net and order what we call a replenishment package, mm -hmm. which is 12 more straps. Um, and they come in a variety of colors. So somebody can call up and say, oh, I want all green or all black or all purple or whatever. So when somebody orders a replenishment, that's 12 straps, uh, 12 sets of connectors oh. to go on it, and two batteries, oh. which is a year's supply. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And, um, and that's forever. Oh, great. That's, that's, that's it. There's no extra charge. We did originally, we still do too, we have a, uh, uh, what we call a lease program okay. where somebody would pay uh, $199 up front and then pay $30 a month if they want to. Okay. But uh, that's more designed really for like people with Alzheimer's dementia because it's not a long-term issue, mm -hmm. but where with kids it is. And there's so many organizations out there now that support children the Flutie Foundation, anybody in New England, not just Massachusetts, but anyone in New England that has a child with autism that can't afford the, 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 uh, the, um, the money, they'll pay for it. Um, when I first found out about it when I was on the job, um, we, uh, we did the, the police department uh, didn't have it in the budget, nor did the town have it in the budget to get the equipment and the training to be on this program. So, um, I figured, well, I will go to a lot of the fraternal organizations in town, Elks, Masons, Kiwanis, and see if maybe they'd all kick in five, six, seven hundred bucks a piece to see, you know, if they, you know, so we could get going on this program because they all exist for one thing, raise money to help people in their community. That's it. That's why they exist. So my first stop was the Masons, the uh, uh, Masons Lodge in Marshfield, and talk, well, talked about this program. They pay for the whole thing. Um, and then in Marshfield alone, and, and this, this, is go, this goes on in a few other towns around the country, since 2010, just through donations from citizens, like at Vinnie's, Vinnie's neighborhood, they sent in a total of $700 in donations to the police department to pay for somebody in town that doesn't, can't afford it yeah. because we saved Vinnie's life. Um, so since 2010, through donations, through uh, civic organizations, through fraternal organizations, through citizens just making donations, the Marshfield police have been paying for these 25 people. No one in Marshfield has, been, has paid for the safety net program. And that's happened to a lot of, a lot of communities around the country. There's a, um, an organization down in Florida named... Um, skips me right now, but it's a, uh, an organization that uh, takes care of seniors. You know, it's a senior, senior facilities. They purchased, uh, I believe, 500 transmitters just to give them to the, to the seniors in the community to prevent them from wandering off and getting lost. Okay, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yes. Sorry, the final. So um, say if someone's um, like parent with Alzheimer's or child with autism, they're wearing the device, they hop on a city bus, right? But you, you as your family member, you don't know that, so you call the police station and say, hey, this is their, freq or this is their frequency number. Can, can you track them like 30, 50 miles away in a receiver? Or? I'm so glad you asked that. Sorry. I don't so, uh, another story with the, Marshfield, uh, the, the Massachusetts State Police. Mm -hmm. They have it in their air wing. Autistic 17-year-old boy in East Boston, mm -hmm. his mom puts him on the bus, the bus goes to the school. There's supposed to be somebody there at the school to take him off the bus. Mm -hmm. One day, they were, they were late. <laughs> off he goes. East Boston, he jumps on a subway train in the Maverick Station. And this kid's goal in life is to ride the subway. That's all he wants to do. <laughs> he's this big, 17 years old, yeah. and he's nonverbal. So he takes off. So the school 
got a little nervous, didn't want to, you know, goes, oh my God, let's see if we can find him first. So they waited an hour before they called 911. Boston police is trained and equipped. The MBTA police are trained and equipped. Massachusetts State Police are trained and equipped with their air wing. So the MBTA and Boston police are searching for this kid for about three hours and they still can't find him. MBTA cops were picking up his signal and all of a sudden it's gone. It's because he's on a train going somewhere. So they call the state police. The state police put a helicopter up and they started in East Boston and they just started zigzagging across the city to going west. Mm -hmm. And in less than 20 minutes, they picked his signal up in Cambridge and they were aiming the antenna at two subway trains that were above ground and they were getting his signal on, on one of those trains, but they didn't know which one yet. So they just sat there and waited. The two trains took off. They pointed the antenna at the one heading toward Framingham, you know, toward west, mm -hmm. nothing. T pointed it at the one heading in town. Beep, 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 got his signal. They were able to radio to the troopers on the ground that train number so-and-so is about to pull into Copley Square, the kids on that train. So it's um, no matter where you are in the state of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, we have full search and rescue coverage. There was a... Um, I t we talk about the, the late reports. This one was classic. Um, elderly person who I actually put the transmitter on uh, in lives in Plymouth. Um, he and his wife live with their adult children in, you know, in the same home. So the children in their 50s you know, go to work in the morning and they came home in the afternoon, 5.30, 5 o'clock, and Nana and Papa are gone. So they're thinking... Mom probably took them down to the canal. There's a, you know, friendlies or something to have a cup of coffee or whatnot. So now it's five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. Then nobody's showing up. Neither one of them have a cell phone. So they finally call 911. So now there's a seven hour, eight hour gap here. They could be in Vermont, New York, New Jersey, <laughs> you know, P-Town, who knows. So the, the, uh, the, there was a search that went on for quite a while. It was, uh, I think, around 12 hours, uh, and they still they couldn't find these people. The, the state police were notified, and they started, I think the first time they were notified with the helicopter, they went north, thinking maybe Boston area, and got nothing. The next day, they started at the, the, uh, you know, the um, east end of the canal and just started going down the, uh, the scenic highway and 15 minutes picked up the signal of the man's transmitter and they were stuck in the Bourne Forest you know, on a dirt road in a car. So they called, you know, the, the, the state police had their FLIR camera uh, where they were able to zero in on the car and the two people that uh, were in it. There's, you know, heat signatures. Thank God they were still alive. Uh, this car was stuck and it, uh, this gentleman's wife, Nana, um, had gotten lost a couple of times before, but the family really didn't want to, you know, admit or say that, yeah, something's wrong. So I think hopefully now that she doesn't, you know, have access to a vehicle, but um, just to, to show you that within minutes, having even with a seven hour late call, uh, they were still able to be located with the, with the uh, transmitter. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.